hope you're all doing well today. If you're doing well today, raise your hand. Let me see. Oh, man, that's like most of you. If you're not so great, I'm sorry. And, um, but you came to the right place because we serve a God, and there is no one higher than Him. Amen? Amen. And there is no one able to turn your day from a bad day to a good day than our God. And maybe the most important question would be, do you know Him? Right? And maybe there's somebody in the room today. Maybe you came here. And and if you were just to be real honest with yourself, you'd say, you know, I don't know that I have a personal relationship with Jesus. And you may know about him. You may have gone to church your entire life. Uh, That does not necessarily mean that you know him personally. Um, That's not for me to judge. That's for you to to sort of ask and to question and to interact around that question with God himself. Uh, There is nothing that I would desire more than that if you don't know Jesus, today would be the day, like Scripture says, of salvation for you, right? Where you would come into a faith relationship with Jesus, and I can assure you, your day would definitely turn around uh, at that moment. doesn't mean all of your life circumstances would instantly be better. It just means you would have Jesus living in you, and that's, that's just always better, amen? Oh man, what a great God we serve. So uh, we're going to be in the book of James this morning. If you've been with us for a few weeks now, then you know this already. But if not, maybe this is your first day to be with us. We have been studying through this letter that James wrote to uh, believers that were scattered abroad during that time. And and today we're going to be getting into chapter 4. Now, I really thought that we were going to work all the way through the first 12 verses of James chapter 4. I was uh, sort of optimistic, and, and, uh, but yeah, no, that's not going to happen today. But we'll get as far as we get. How about that? Uh, that's the promise I make you. We will get as far as we get today. I'm pretty sure I can uh, fulfill that promise to you today. Uh, eventually, we'll get through verse 12. I think it's probably going to be next week before we do that. A lot of you like to take notes. I know that. If you do, uh, I tell you, I'm going to give you the title. Is it already on the screen? It's on the screen. Faith Works, right? That's the title of our series. And, and I, what I want to do with you before we kind of jump in too deep here is I want to review with you, if you go back in your minds with me a few weeks I, I, ago, I talked to you about five commitments that I think we should make as a church and as individual believers as we're studying through this book together. And, and these are commitments that sort of you know, come out of the chapters as we've divided them up of, of this little letter that James wrote. And so the first commitment that I want to remind you of is this, and this is based in James chapter 1 and verse 22. It says this, I will be a doer of the word and not just a hearer, right? It is God's desire that we don't just take in the word, but that we actually put it into practice. And from that verse, really, we sort of get the title of our series, Faith Works. If you believe in Jesus, you have faith in him that actually works its way out in your life. That's the idea behind that, based in James chapter 1 and verse 22. Out of verse or chapter 2, we have another commitment that we're making as followers of Christ, and it's this. I will love my neighbor as myself. Anybody heard that before? I will love, like somebody somewhat famous said that, right? His name was Jesus, heard of him. He said, look, we're supposed to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our, what, neighbor as ourself. Uh, this morning in our Discover One Life group, I got to share with uh, that group, that that's part of our vision, is, is to love our neighbors, right? And to do neighboring events and, and, and just to be friendly and kind and loving to them in order that they can see Jesus living through us. And it's a commitment that we have from Scripture. The third one is this. I will use my mouth to praise God and to bless others. And Pastor Justin, a couple of weeks ago, uh, talked to us about that out of James chapter 3. Well, today we get into chapter 4, and this is where we get our fourth commitment as we're reading through this together, and is this, I will submit to God and resist the devil. And, and, and I don't think we're going to quite get there this week, but for sure next week we'll jump into that. I will submit to God and resist the devil. And then our last commitment comes out of James chapter 5, verse 16. I will confess my faults and I will pray for others. These are the things, amongst other things, that God is calling us to do as those who are following after Jesus. Well, again, uh, we're going to sort of start moving our way towards our fourth commitment. I will submit to God and resist the devil today. What we're going to do, and like I said, if you take notes um, at the top of your page, I'm going to give you the title of the message today, and it's The Fight Club. 
the Fight Club. Now, I know there was a movie called Fight Club. I've actually never seen that movie. And so, you know, if there's anything similar between this message and that, like it's accidental, I guess, because I don't, I don't really know. I think there was fighting in the movie, you know, right? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and so, uh, but we're going we're gonna to be in James chapter 4, verse 1 to 12. Today's going to be part 1. Next week will be part 2. And, and here's why I think this is really important for us today. Number one, God put it in his word, right? So, I mean, it's, it's automatically important for us. But, but we all have experienced fighting or conflict on some level, right? And so in that sense, that's why I would say, welcome to the club, right? Because that's, that's everybody. If you're new to this church, by the way, maybe this is your first time. And, and maybe you're like kind of checking us out. Maybe you're new to the area and you're thinking, I want to find a new church family. Uh, we come from a really great one. Let's check this one out. So let me, just, let me just give you a little clue about this church, right? We're not perfect. We fight all the time, right? Like we're, we're still trying to be shaped into the image of Christ. We're growing in him. Uh, we're we're kind of messed up, but Jesus is making us a little bit better day by day. Ultimately, we're being sanctified by him, and we are anticipating the day when we will be made totally brand new in the image of Christ when we spend eternity with him. Amen? Are you looking forward to that? I can assure you I definitely am. Uh, in the meantime, uh, fighting with others, fighting within ourselves, fighting even sometimes against God. You ever found yourself to be doing that, fighting with God? Uh, I know some of you have. I know I have at times. When we just don't understand the circumstances of our life. Well, James is going to be talking to us about some of these things. Now, of course, we're not going to cover every detail in, uh, in this particular passage. There's really way too much here. And again, so much that this week I really intended to go further, but I, I kind of just had to divide it in half. But what I want to do between this week and next week is give you five principles that I sort of just gleaned from the passage that I hope will help us fight better. And when I say fight better, I mean fight against our flesh and fight against the enemy that we have. Um, that's not your spouse, by the way, right? It's not any other human beings. That's not your enemy. We have an enemy. He's named in the Bible. He is the devil. He's down in chapter 4. You'll see him there in verse 7. But we want to fight better against our flesh and against our enemy. But we also want to fight less, right? Right? Uh, we want to fight less with others. We want to fight less with God. We want to submit ourselves to him and be growing in him. And so uh, that's the idea, is just take these five principles and, and, and begin to work those things out and put those into practice in our life. I'm going to give you two today and then three next week. And so uh, here's the first one. We're just going to jump right in. And, and, and the first principle that, again, just me studying through this, kind of what I gleaned from this was we really should expect conflict right as followers of jesus it should be an expectation that we have why do i say that look at verse one james chapter four says this where do wars and fights come from among you now, i just want to pause there i know it's kind of in the middle of the verse where he just asked this question right hey where do wars and fights come from among you like in other words i, I know this is happening for you i know this is a part of what you're living and, and when you read through scripture what you find out is that conflict was prevalent right and, and you have lived that out in your own life, haven't you? I mean, you've had fights and conflicts at home, at, at school, at work, uh, in your neighborhood. Anybody ever fight with your neighbors? You're supposed to be loving your neighbors, and yet we find ourselves fighting. If you've never done that, I have a story from you, come ask, for you. I, come ask me. I can tell you about fighting with neighbors. You're not supposed to do that, by the way, but, but I do have some experience. And so if you need some help with that, let me know. Um, fighting with your neighbors, fighting at church. Anybody shocked by that, by the way? Did, did you know that sometimes Christians at churches get into conflicts and they fight with one another? I don't see anybody's mouth dropping open like you're shocked. <laughs> right? Like, this happens. You, you know what's kind of funny to me? Is that sometimes we're shocked when it happens. And, and to be honest with you, and that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make with this. Like, we should, as followers of Jesus expect conflict because it happens all the time ever since human beings have been a thing guess what there's been there's been fighting and there's been conflict now here's what i'm not saying i'm not saying that we should accept conflict or fighting i'm saying we should expect it and there's a difference right so we're not going to just like lay back and accept it like it's just how it is and and it's just whatever right no we're not going to do that because we know that like unity and peace, like that's what God desires for us, right? So we're not just going to 
accept conflict as a fact of life, but we are going to expect it. For, let me give you a couple of scriptures. For example, Psalm 133, verse 1. And these are about God's desires, right? Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In, in other words, to the, in today's language, you say, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you should get along with other followers of Jesus. In fact, God really loves that. He says that's really good, and that is his desire for us. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, we referenced this verse last week. It says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with those who are your favorite people in the world. Wait, no, wait. No, that's not what it says, right? Live peaceably with all men. It's God's desire that you in particular, as someone who knows and loves Jesus, that you live at peace as much as is possible. Peace, obviously, as opposed to to conflict, right? Um, But the challenge is that conflict is a thing, and fighting is a thing, even amongst the brothers. Now, we're not going to accept it because we know God wants something else, but we should expect it. As I mentioned already, as long as humans have existed, fightings have existed as well, right? And, and that could be anything from arguments to, like, all-out wars. In, in fact, if you just kind of do a little survey through the Bible with me, like, the first fight, at least that I, like, really remember in the Bible, was between Cain and Abel. Well, I mean, like, like if you just start in Genesis, right? I, I think there was an argument, sort of, between God and Satan. You could kind of read about that in Isaiah or Ezekiel. And I don't even know if that would be called an argument, but there was, a, there was definitely a disagreement, right? Um, and, and that ended rather abruptly when God kicked him out of heaven and and so on. But humanly speaking, Cain and Abel like got into it, didn't they? In fact, that led to Cain killing his brother Abel. I mean, we're we're like all the way into Genesis chapter 4 when all of a sudden fighting is happening in the world. If you move forward a little bit, you run into Abraham and Lot, and I'm not even going to hit them all, of course, but Abraham and Lot Uh, uncle and nephew and they were fighting and and the people that worked for them were fighting and they got into it and they kind of had to go their separate ways right and and then probably in your lifetime you've had relationships where you eventually just went your separate ways because there was fighting happening move forward a little bit Uh, that was an uncle and a nephew Uh, obviously families fight right David and Absalom got into it so Absalom was one of David's sons and and they got into it and, and literally, there was an, a, a civil war, basically, that took place in Israel because David and Absalom were fighting with one another. Move forward to the New Testament. I skipped about 10,000 arguments and fights in the Old Testament. Get into the New Testament, and those that were, like you'd say, the closest to Jesus, we call them his disciples, right? Um, they got into it with one another. And there were arguments and disagreements and fights with one another. And, and, and I could imagine some yelling happening. I don't know if there was any pushing and shoving or not. Uh, but they definitely were disputing with one another regularly. When you read through the letters that God wrote to New Testament churches, like and he used Paul and Peter and John and others, but Paul wrote a letter to the, the church um, of, of Corinth, right, where there were some believers there. Uh, now, Corinth, they, they weren't exactly like the model church for all ages, right? In fact, if you read through the Corinthians, the, the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, it's just a letter where Paul's saying, okay, here's a problem, let's talk about that. And you know what the first problem that they ran into was? They were disputing with one another over who had baptized whom, right? And, well, yeah, but, you know, and, and like trying to one-up each other in the church. Uh, it got so bad in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul had to tell this church, Hey, listen, you guys really shouldn't be taking each other to court before lost people. I, I mean, surely, as followers of Jesus, you can work out your fights and disagreements with one another in such a way that you're not suing each other. Like, what a terrible testimony this was in that community. Paul said, no, that, that shouldn't be that way. When Paul wrote his letter to the churches of Galatia, in Galatians chapter 5, he said, But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. Why was he talking about them biting and devouring one another? Because there were were fights that were happening. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 3, Paul says, here's what you should be doing. We should be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit 
in the bond of peace. Why would Paul need to say that to the church at Ephesus? Because there were believers there. They were fighting and arguing and contending with one another. When he wrote the letter to the, the church at Philippi, there were particularly two women, and he called them out by name, Euodia and Syntyche, I think is how you say. He said, hey guys, listen, can you help me please? These two ladies in your congregation are fighting with one another. Can you come alongside them and help them work this thing out? And, and, and so all through the Bible, you see that where there were believers, they were fighting with one another and arguing and disputing, and, and they had to figure this out. And so what's the point that we're making here? The point that I'm trying to make is, look, as I see it in Scripture, this is something that we should expect. It, it's a reality of life, and it always has been. We're not going to accept it. We're not going to be okay with it, but we're not going to be shocked by it either. Um, now, I'm, I'm assuming I'm talking to people who understand, like, like you're with me here, right? Anybody in here had a fight maybe with your brother or sister? You had siblings growing up? It, it, like, is there anyone that had siblings and you never fought with them, ever? Right? I mean, like, so rare that that would ever happen. Uh, maybe with your mom or your dad? Anybody ever had an argument, a, a fight with mom or dad? Right? Some of you may be in the room today, like, like you still are having, you're still in fights with mom and dad right? Did I hear something from over here? <laughs> I feel like some of the young people are like, oh, amen, pastor. Like, they're trying to say it under their breath because they don't want mom and dad to go, whoa, what? Was that my kid over there? Um, but like, it happens, right? Uh, now, I know, thankfully, in this church, like married people, you guys have never fought with one another. Um, right. <laughs> right? So that, that, that's a thing that happens. We fight with friends, strangers sometimes isn't it the weirdest thing that you would get in a fight with a stranger because it's like it's like you're affirming that you actually care about them i guess you should right because we're supposed to love our neighbor but but i mean sometimes we fight with people we don't even know and, and we get into it over the silliest things for sure um, fights happen with co-workers oh, aren't they a joy <laughs> co-workers bosses again neighbors and even other believers maybe there's someone that you are in a dispute with in this room right now. Like, I would kind of be shocked if in this room someone wasn't fighting with someone else even as we speak, given the fact that we are who we are. So we're not going to be surprised by conflict. We're going to expect it. But here's, here's what I, I want to make sure that we don't take away from this message, this. Like, we're not going to take conflict or fighting lightly, right? Because here, in fact, we're going to read this in just a moment. But what seems to be true is that oftentimes, if not always, but almost always, where there is, I'm going to say conflict, and by conflict I mean fighting, like he says here, wars and fights among you, um, then there's sin involved somewhere. And so we can't take that lightly, right? Now, I, I do want to kind of hit the pause button real quick, and Pastor Justin brought this to my attention this week as we were just kind of talking through some of this stuff. Um, like when we're talking about conflict and fighting here, obviously, like James is saying, hey, this is a problem, right? And all through scripture, like we see this as a problem. Uh, but I want you to know, I'm not s simply talking about like a disagreement, right? So like we can disagree about something and not fight about it, right? And, and you can disagree with your husband or wife or your kids or your parents or a coworker or a spouse or, you know, a, a, a boss. Like you, we can have a disagreement. We simply don't see eye to eye on that thing I mean, we could do that without without fighting and, and so like when does it cross over and, and I suppose every scenario would would maybe be different but but it seems that like when we when we cross over from disagreeing to fighting now like I'm trying to win right I'm trying to gain an advantage I might be trying to even injure or, or I'm trying to prove my point I'm trying to get my way right but now we're now we're crossing over we don't just uh, disagree in our minds or in a discussion about something now i'm trying to push and pressure and take advantage in some way now now we're fighting in ways that god wants to step in and say hey we need to we need to talk about this well what are, what are we going to do about that what, what should we do about that well that's that's the next point that i want to share with you today um, is is we want to look within yourself first and what i want us to do is finish reading verse one we're going to read down through verse six and this is as far as we'll get today. But when it comes to um, fighting and, and warring amongst ourselves, the first thing we want to do is look within ourselves 
before we look anywhere else. Let's, let's begin reading verse 1 again. We'll read down through verse 6. Scripture says this, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now, James, I mentioned to you, he asks a lot of questions. The obvious answer is yes, right? That's, that's where this comes from, he says. Verse 2, he says, You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you ask not, or you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Verse 6 says, but he who gives more grace, or, I'm sorry, but he gives more grace, meaning God. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when conflict arises, when, when a fight is happening, what do we need to do? We've got to look within ourselves first. And, and when I say that, I don't say that to imply necessarily that the conflict is your fault, right? But I do believe that we should always ask the question, uh, what part have I played in this conflict? That, that's usually not the first place we go because we just assume, you know, it's my wife's fault or it's my son's fault or it's my boss's fault. You know, they're the ones who were wrong, obviously. And, and, and I think what we need to do is take a look within ourselves because this is where God starts with us in James chapter 4. He says, wait, is, isn't what really is going on here is there are some things that you desire and, and you're not getting those things. And so from within you, there are things rising up and you're doing things and you're saying things that are causing fights and wars with other people. So we need to look within ourselves. Now, the goal of looking within ourselves is not, I'm not, I'm not trying to blame you. I'm not trying to shame you, certainly not. But the goal is that we can figure out how to resolve the conflict with others, right? Figure out what do we do about this? Maybe I need to figure out how to resolve this battle that's happening within myself. Because the battle isn't always with those out there. It's, it's with myself. Sometimes we're, we're battling. We're in a fight with the Lord, as we mentioned. We want to figure out how to resolve that. So if you go back, they do not come, or do they not come, verse 1, from your desires for pleasure that war in your members pleasure that war in your members in other words james is saying here's what happens when there's a fight usually at least with one of the parties if not both i want something that i'm not getting right now right or i want something that i don't have and i'm willing to fight you to get that and this happens all the time basically he's saying your desires right now are not in alignment with god's desires and you're willing to do things according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. You're, you're willing to sinfully engage another person so that you can get what you want. And as I was thinking about that this week, I thought, you know, sometimes I think, like at the root, maybe I really do desire what God would desire for me. But what happens is I'm, I'm trying to get the things that I desire in ways that are contrary to what God has planned for me. Are you tracking with me? In other words, like maybe what I really want is, is peace, you know, and I want happiness and I want joy and I want significance in my life, but I've got to be willing to get those things in the way that God says I should get them and through whom God says I should get them, not just any way that I want. So part of the goal here is to make sure that I'm aligning my desires with God's desires for our lives well what could that look like um so we could think about sexual purity right we have certain desires in us and the question that we would have is are my desires in alignment with god's desires when it concerns sexual behavior or purity or activity right um and by the way the world is going to teach us something very different from what god teaches us right and we see that happening in our world today as it concerns faithfulness in marriage, are my desires in line with God's desires? As it concerns living a, a life that is godly and healthy and holy, are my desires aligned with God's? 
Do I have the same kind of perspective on work that God says that I should have? Or do I desire something different and the list could go on and on? Are we willing to align ourselves? And, and, and we're going to get to this next week, in verse 7. Therefore, submit yourself to God. I mean, am I going to put myself under God's desires and align myself with him? I want you to look at verse 2. He begins to sort of list off some of the problems, some of the desires of the flesh that are battling inside of me that, that cause me to get into uh, fights with other people. Verse 2, he says, you lust and you do not have. Now, when we think about lust, we often think about sexual immorality, but lust can be an inordinate desire or craving or affection for uh, really basically anything. It could be for food, it could be for money, it could be for possessions, it could be for recognition, it could be for fame. And, and when I have this inordinate desire, and when I say, when I say inordinate, it's outside of, of the will of God for my life. I'm willing to go after that thing uh, almost in any way, and I'll run over anybody, and, and, and I'll have conflict with anybody so that I can get what it is that I want and that I desire. Because you lust, and you do not have. In other words, whenever we're in a conflict, we need to ask ourselves, we need to look within, okay, what, what, what part might I have in this conflict? Is there some sort of desire in me where I'm not getting what I want and so I'm willing to offend and I'm willing to fight to get that thing that I'm desiring? He goes on, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. Now murder, what a strong term, right? Sometimes, sadly, tragically, uh, people fight to the point of literally killing another person. Unfortunately, we hear about these kinds of things all the time. I think for most of us, in the room, it, that would be unusual. I sure hope it is. Uh, most of us uh, hopefully haven't killed someone else. Nevertheless, uh, sometimes we do word, use words that are intended to damage and, and in a figurative sense, kill someone, to put them down, to put them under, to put them aside, to get rid of them. Uh, and we manipulate with our words and with our behavior in order to get what we want he, he says in the same breath, you murder and you covet and cannot obtain. So coveting is like being envious or jealous of, of something that someone else has that, that I desire, right? Uh, I think we've all done this before. One of the things that I find interesting is like it's in the same breath, right? You murder and you covet. So sometimes like in my mind, I'm going to put murder way up here, but you know, coveting, like that's down here. That, that's like a lower thing. And God goes, well, actually, like, like it's just... It's just another one of the sins that causes fighting amongst you. It's one of those things that needs to be dealt with. It's one of those things that you need to examine your heart and look inside. And say, am I envious or jealous of another person? And that's why I'm coming at them. And that is what is creating this conflict. In verse 3, he addresses our, our motives. And he says, you fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, the desires of our flesh. It's interesting that even as believers, he says, look, look, this isn't, we're not just talking about lost people here. We're talking about people that, that come to God and they pray and they're asking God for things, but they're asking for things that aren't in accordance with the will of God. They're asking for things so that they can consume them uh, on their own or in their own pleasures, right? He says, you're asking amiss, you're missing the mark. The things that you're praying are not even the things that God perhaps is concerned about in your life. And so, so you're missing. Your motive is off. You're, you're praying, but you're praying selfish prayers. They're really about you. You know, we can pray, I would say, even the right things with the wrong motive. We can pray so that others will, will, will look at us. We can pray so that I will get things. Have you ever, like, debated with God or, or sort of try to talk him into something, you know, like, hey, God, if you would just do this, if you would give me this, then I would do this. And like, wouldn't that be really amazing? I mean, wouldn't that really help the kingdom, right? Um, and, and I've prayed that way. Surely we all have. I finally stopped praying that I would win the lottery. I mean, it's like, you know, because that God, like I would tithe double off of the lottery, right? I mean, I would do so much good with that 
But why was I really praying that, right? It wasn't about, it wasn't about that. It was, it was about me, right? It was my pleasures, and, and, and it's all that other that I'm going to do with that stuff. That's really why I wanted that. And sometimes we can pray <clears throat> that way. So God um, knows that, right? God, God doesn't see just the outside of us. He looks at our hearts. And, and so as he's speaking through James here, he says, look, you guys are fighting and there's wars. Don't you know where that comes from? It comes from within you. So look within yourself. Let's figure out how to resolve the conflict in our lives. The first thing we want to do is look inside and begin to ask ourselves, is there something I'm desiring that, that maybe is just, just out of order? Am I willing to do whatever it takes to get that thing that I don't have that I really desire? I'm, I'm fighting. I'm worrying. I still don't have. Now I'm praying about it, but I'm praying about it even for the wrong reasons. It gets into verse 4. And he says, adulterers and adulteresses. Now, now let's, he's not in this passage, he's not talking about those who are literally adulterers and adulteresses. He's saying, those of you who follow Jesus, and this is the way you're living your life, you are an adulterer or an adulteress. It, it's the kind of terminology that he used in the Old Testament when Israel, who was married and in relationship with God, when they would turn away from God. And they would follow their flesh and seek their own desires. Instead of obeying God, they would do the things that they wanted to do. And they would do them the way they wanted to do them, thinking that would get them what they really wanted. And he said, no, spiritually, they're being unfaithful to God. And that's exactly what he's saying to us. When we're fighting and warring with others around us, or even within ourselves, or even with God, he says, no, no, no. You want to be faithful to God. And that's not where you're at right now. Verse 4, he continues, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? There's, there's hostility between you and God when you're choosing the world over him. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I think we should pause and just like ask this question, right? Because we're trying to, what we're trying to do is figure out why the conflict, why the fight, what's going on in my life? Why, why is this happening? For some of us, it's recurring. It's all the time. It's a habit, Right? For some of us, maybe not, it's occasional. Nevertheless, the admonition of Scripture would be the same. Hey, look within yourself. Let's figure this out. But start on the inside. Let's figure this out. Maybe ask yourself this question. Are, am I feeding my soul with the world? Or am I feeding my soul with the Word of God? Because that's going to impact what's coming out. It's going to impact how you interact with God. It's going to impact how you think about the thoughts that come into your mind and in your heart. It's going to impact how you treat others around you at work and at school and in our neighborhoods. What am I feeding my soul with? The world or the word? Do you spend more time on TikTok or more time in God's word? Sorry, young people. The old people, they don't, even, they don't get that, but... You know I'm talking to you about that one, right? Um, do you spend more time on Facebook? That's for the old people, right? Uh, more time on Facebook? Scrolling? Or do you spend more time scrolling through the pages of God's Word? Feeding your soul? Netflix? Oof. Now I'm meddling, right? What, what are we feeding our souls with? Sometimes it's just, just hobbies. We get busy doing stuff that, hey, listen, hobbies are great. I think you should have one. Or, or multiple, right? Uh, but that shouldn't be the thing that, that replaces the time that we spend with God. For some of us, it's really good things like, um, you know, our kids' activities and events and their, their sports. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that can get out of balance and can get out of control. And, and as parents, we're sort of feeding ourselves with the activity of family. And it sounds really good. Sounds really good, except that you don't come to church anymore, you don't spend time in the Word, you're not praying together anymore, you don't have dinner together anymore, because you don't have time for that, because we're going here and there, and we're everywhere, and, and we've become so filled with the things that the world wants to fill our lives with, that we're not feeding our soul with God's truth, and God's people. Um. And, and the list could go on, right? I mean, I mean, hopefully the Spirit of God is stirring in your soul, and, and, and He's pointing out Oh, you know what it is for me? It's, it's this thing. Looking within ourselves. Worldly influences. He says, you know, if, if you want to be a friend of the world, you're making yourself an enemy with God. And by the way, that's not where you want to be. How many of you fought with God and it turned out well for you? <laughs> right, like it, that never works out well. Hopefully it was short term. 
Um, you know, you can go through the Bible, and I think it was Jacob in the Bible. He fought with God once, and he walked with a limp the rest of his life. Literally. Literally wrestled with God in a way that, like, I don't even understand. But he literally walked with a limp the rest of his life as a reminder. I fought with God. I lost that one. <laughs> Jonah, he, he fought with God too. D- decided, I'm going to disobey God just this one time. I'm going to go the other way. Uh, that didn't work out too well for him. It, it doesn't say specifically. He probably was physically marked by the stomach acid of the creature that he was in. <clears throat> As a reminder, he fought with God and he lost. It never works that well. What's at the root of all of that, do you think? Well, I think it's in verse 6. Watch what it says. But he, God, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the what? Anybody there with me? God resists the who? The, the, the proud, right? The, those who are prideful, God resists, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, you got bad news and good news mixed in right here. It's like the gospel, right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God resists the proud. Terrible news, but he gives grace to the humble. Great news. That's the gospel. Oh, man. Thank you, God, for your grace. So what's really at the root of our fighting, James says, hey, look within yourself. Boy, is there lust? Are you motivated by the wrong things? Are you praying the wrong way? Are are you doing anything you can to ride over the top of people so you can get what you want? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a a boss. Maybe it's a neighbor. Whoever that might be. He says, you know what's really at the root of all that? It's pride. And God resists the proud. And, And when we fight with him, when we fight within, when we fight with others, he says, here's what's really going on in your soul. It's, it's pride. I would say pride is really at the root of all sin, isn't it? And, and we know what happens, right? When your heart is filled with pride, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Just know, pride has no place in the life of a believer. And so the next time that you experience conflict, What I'm saying, based on the the teaching of God's word here, is that we need to look within ourselves and ask, what do I have to own here? Like, that's where we begin, right? And I'll give you some more next week, right? But but start there. Start with, what do I have to own here? What part have I played in this? And begin to think through and meditate and pray over these words of Scripture and ask yourself, what is there in me? What desires and pleasures am I really trying to get? And that's what's creating this fight, at least in part. So we need to wrap up. How are we going to do that? Um, So my guess is, and I was thinking about this week, and I thought, my guess is you're going to experience some conflict this week. You're welcome. And it's like when you talk about this stuff, it's like God brings it up and says, okay, let's work on that one. Why? Because faith works, right? And so you're someone who has faith in Jesus. It, more than likely, you're, maybe you haven't had a conflict in years. Like, that'd be weird, right? But maybe you haven't. Just expect it. Like, it happens. It's going to happen. So what are you going to do? Well, at least now you know it's coming, right? I've, I've given you the warning. And, and so here's what I'm hoping that you're going to do. I'm hoping that what you're going to do is you're going to do everything possible to live peaceably with all men. Right? You're going to put Romans chapter 12 into practice. You say, well, and then you're going to look within yourself, and, and, and you're going to begin to examine your life and ask God, hey, have the Spirit of God examine my heart and mind. Where is their pride? Where is their lust? Where is their envy? Where am I crossing a line? And I'm stepping into sin to get what I want. And then once that's been identified, we're going to repent of that pride, knowing that God resists the proud. But at the same time, we're going to rejoice because as we turn away from sin and we turn away from pride, what's God going to give you? He's going to give you grace. And you're going to say, God, please forgive me for crossing your line. Please forgive me for getting my desires out of balance. Lord, I want to kill those things, not the people around me. Lord, help me. To put to death the pride and the ignorance, put to death my flesh, to die daily, as Paul said, and to walk in the Spirit. I'm turning away from that, and I'm turning to you, asking for your grace and your mercy and your love to fill my life and flow through me to the people around me. When that happens, excuse me, I can assure you, uh, that conflict's going to begin to look a lot different. That fight is going to change 
and you're going to be helping others see that Jesus makes a difference, not only eternally, but practically, every day that we put to practice his word. What will that do? Man, that's going to change your family. It's going to change your workplace. It'll change your neighborhood. And let's pray to that end, all right? Father, thanks so much for your goodness. Thanks for your word. Lord, it's so practical. It's so real. It's so relevant. Lord, I, I, I pray that the Spirit of God would shape us and change us and move us to make us more like Jesus. And we know that that's a process. And we'll be, we'll be working on that until Jesus comes or until he calls us home. But Lord, we pray that you would be busy this week working in our lives. Lord, here's what I'm, I'm asking. I hope and I pray that when we get into some kind of conflict this week, I pray that you would immediately arrest our attention and that we would turn to Christ, we turn to the Spirit, and we would turn to the Word and we would look within ourselves and, and look for an opportunity to repent of pride and to receive grace from you. Thank you for being a God of grace, a God who says that your grace is sufficient for us in every trial, in every trouble, in every fight. Lord, we can overcome in Jesus' name. Lord, I wonder if in this room someone's in a, in a battle in their soul today. And it's a battle about whether or not they will, they will yield and submit themselves to you. Lord, I pray that you would increase their faith and that they would willingly and humbly bow down before you and express a need for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and confess their sin and receive him into their life. Lord, receiving the gift of eternal life. We praise you and thank you for that gift. Lord, help us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.